Hello, everybody, and welcome to our Genomic Innovator Seminar Series. This is our final seminar in this series, so I really uh, appreciate everyone attending, uh, and thank you for being here today. So my name is Chris Gunter. I am the Senior Advisor to the Director for Genomics Engagement here at NHGRI, um, and I'm excited to introduce you to my co-moderator and our speakers. So if you remember, we decided to come up with this seminar series because what we wanted to do is highlight some of the early career scientists whom we have uh, who had won some of our genomic innovator awards previously. Those are awarded for um, early career ideas, which are uh, look like they have the um, promise to be very exciting. So my co-moderator today, because we're focusing on genomic medicine, is Dr. Rob Rowley. He's a program director in the Division of Genomic Medicine at NHGRI and an internal medicine physician uh, who joined NHGRI about five years ago. So you'll hear more from him later because he is going to be asking questions of our speakers. Um, so the the, the kind of run of show for today is that I'm going to introduce our speakers um, and then they will each speak for about 20 minutes and then Rob will ask them some questions uh, that he has come up with and looking at their work and then at around the four o'clock ish mark we're going to take questions from you the audience we really encourage you to ask us questions so the chat function is disabled but you could submit questions via the Q&A so I encourage you to do that and I'll remind you of that throughout the seminar um, and we will We'll start looking at those around four o'clock-ish. So please feel free to put those in as we go along so that we can be uh, collating them and then Rob will be asking those of the speakers. So let me introduce you to our speakers. Our early uh, career investigator is Dr. Jason Vassy, who's an associate professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. He's also in the section of general internal medicine at the VA Boston Healthcare System. And he is a founding member of Precision Population Health at Ariadne Labs. So he's a practicing primary care internist and researcher in the implementation and evaluation of genomic medicine interventions, which is what he's gonna tell you about today. And then our more established researcher who's gonna add a lot of valuable context to uh, more work in this area is Dr. Katrina Goddard. She's the director of the Division of Cancer Control and Population Sciences at the National Cancer Institute. So right nearby us here. She was appointed that director in October, 2021. And in that position, she oversees a division that covers a wide range of scientific domains and disciplines, including epidemiology, behavioral science, surveillance and statistics, cancer survivorship and health services and outcomes research. So we are honored to be here and have them today. I hope you will ask them a lot of good questions and I will turn it over to Jason, thank you. Great, well, Chris and everybody, thank you for that introduction. Thank you for this opportunity. Um, it, is, it is truly a privilege to be able to share with NHGRI and the larger community um, what, uh, what I've been able to do with this opportunity that was given to me by NHGRI. So this really, really was kind of a, um, it really was a career defining award for me in many ways and so i'll be able to tell you a little bit about uh about that experience and and some of the the findings we've already learned from this process so let me get my slides up we'll take it from there so um as chris mentioned i'm a primary care provider uh but i am interested in the implementation or maybe the mainstreaming of so-called genomic medicine so the use of someone's genotype to help inform their medical care often thought of as a way we don't currently do it in in, in current practice. Um, and so over my, my career, I've, I've looked at various flavors of genomic medicine, pharmacogenetic testing, return of monogenic results. Um, but you'll see that there's a there's been a little bit of a kind of return to my roots in polygenic risk scores that I'll tell you a little bit about and what we're doing currently in this space. So I should also say, as a VA employee, um, my, my views I express here are not uh, representative of those of the government or the VA specifically, but I do want to give uh, what, I, what I think is this, a scientific liter literate audience here a very brief overview of what we mean by polygenic risk scores. Then I'll take a step back and, and talk about defining clinical utility. Um, and I think this is where Katrina and I will have some really good conversations about what exactly that means. She's done a lot of scholarship in this area. I have some thoughts. She has some, she certainly has some thoughts. Um, so that'll be a good, a good conversation. And then I'll, I'll illustrate some work I've been doing in clinical trials, including, including the Genova study, which is funded by, by this award from NHGRI. So, you know, as was mentioned, I'm a primary care doctor. And so what's a primary care doctor doing in this space? <laughs> so, you know, but I think really my clinical practice informs my research interests and then vice versa. So, you know, as you sit down with patients and you start to then 
accumulate clinical experience and you've seen your hundredth patient, your thousandth patient, your 10,000th patient, um, certainly the individual characteristics of that patient in front of you matter, but then you start to think about patterns. Um, some of the patterns are the patterns you're taught in medical school. The, the, you know, what does smoking lead to a higher risk of? And there are some, then there are some patients that really don't seem to fit the patterns that you're taught or that you started to accumulate from just clinical experience. And that's when you really start scratching your head. What is it that we as scientists, as clinicians, don't yet understand about risk? And what predisposes somebody to risk of disease? So, you know, not only are diet and exercise, as I've illustrated on this slide, a part of that, but you also then, there's that nagging suspicion. I wonder if this is so-called genetic or if it's hereditary or it runs in the family. Um, and I think really that, as I was finishing my internal medicine training, and then moved into a general internal medicine research fellowship, it was that interest in epidemiology and, and increasingly was becoming an interest in genetic epidemiology that, that kind of led me down the path that I'm on now. And interestingly, one of the first fellowship projects I took on in 2011 was a return of, of it's almost, almost not fair to say polygenic risk scores um, because we, this was a, a score for predisposition to type two diabetes. It consisted of 36 SNPs that were known at the time. You can see this was an early report that we gave back in a clinical trial at Mass General to individuals, even you know, SNP by SNP, we told them what their results were and whether that was associated with an increase or lower risk of type two diabetes, which you know is a common complex trait. And the hypothesis of this randomized trial, the GCLC trial that we did, was to see, all right, could we use that information to motivate individuals who we already knew were at risk for type 2 diabetes because they had metabolic syndrome or were overweight? Could somehow this genetic information be a motivating factor, make them attend more weight loss um, uh, classes in a curriculum they were a part of, or uh, lose more weight or adopt healthier behaviors? Overall, there were some signals towards changes in attitude, but it turned out to be a null study in terms of meaningful weight loss or, um, or other stages of behavior change. But it did start to whet my appetite about what would it take to start to move information like this into primary care where we could use it as a clinically useful tool? And what, how would we even define what clinically useful means? So this is my one slide to, to orient you to what a polygenic risk score is. Um, I will not be able to do this full topic justice, but suffice it to say that across an individual's genome, if you look at the millions or even you know, millions of different markers um, across the genome, you can do millions of different case control studies for their, their likelihood of having a certain disease or not. So you then take the effect sizes of each one of those loci across the genome, and you can add it up as a weighted score, assign each individual uh, a score, and that, that would place an individual somewhere on a bell curve of genetic predisposition to a disease. And these are used, often used no, for, for complex common traits, continuous, create, continuous traits such as LDL cholesterol, but also dichotomous traits, diagnoses. So cancer, prostate cancer, yes or no, type 2 diabetes, yes or no. Um, and these can be calculated from genotype array data, so-called SNP chips, or increasingly genome-wide genome sequence data too. Um, so you could present the, the, what we'll call the clinical validity um, or the association of these, of these PRS with disease in a few different ways. So if you look, this is from a kind of seminal paper from Karen Chafin from a few years ago. If you look at the panel on the left, if you imagine bell curve of these polygenic risk scores, you could define what you think are clinically meaningful cut points, and then you could identify the percentage of the population that's above that cut point for a certain kind of risk. In this, in this case, it was for coronary disease, those different cut points corresponding to threefold, fourfold, fivefold risk of the disease. You could portray it as cases and controls and how the polygenic risk scores among cases of CAD and controls of CAD are apportioned across the population. You can see here that this is not a diagnostic test. There are lots of cases that have PRS lower than controls and vice versa. So this is clearly not the, the ability to discriminate between ultimate cases and controls is not perfect. In panel C, you could represent the data as 
individuals with a certain percentile in the polygenic risk score distribution and what absolute prevalence of coronary disease is that associated with in this case. So you can see that the prevalence shown in this graph range, ranges from zero to single, still single digits of, pre of prevalence uh, of coronary disease. Now, I won't ask for audience participation, but I will ask you sitting there in your chair to play the thought experiment along with me. How would you uh, define or fill in the blanks to this question? A polygenic risk score has clinical utility when? So a lot of people have thought about how to answer this question. Uh, there, I, my read of the field is that consensus is emerging, although it's not. there's not a single right answer. Uh, but I think we are kind of agreeing on some of the concepts, which I hope will illustrate some during this talk. I found the work, even though it's more than 15 years old now, I have found the work of the EGAP group to still really be helpful in thinking about um, putting clinical utility in its bigger context of kind of a hierarchy of evidence for genetic tests. So what's often called the ACCE model starts with the bare basics of first, a test must have analytic validity. So if you think your test can tell whether a certain SNP is an A or a T, can it actually reliably tell an, an A when there's an A? If you can't, you're kind of done. You know, you need to find a, a different test. So assuming your, your lab test has analytic validity, what's the clinical validity? How do we know that if it's an A there, that A is actually really associated with disease? So that's clinical utility. And both of those are really required before you can begin to talk about the, I'm sorry, that those are, that's those, you have to be able to have one of both of those before you can go on to talk about the clinical utility of that information. And EGAP defined clinical utility as the ability of test results to change patient management decisions and improve net outcomes. And we can talk about how that might apply in PRS. So before we do, let me illustrate those concepts with pharmacogenetics. So here was a in the, the EGAP paper, a way of illustrating these concepts. So let's say you wanted to use someone's a genotype at a certain cytochrome P450 locus to influence your, your prescribed prescription of an antidepressant to treat their depression. So the analytic validity is, can you can your test actually measure the genotype you think you're measuring? Like I said, if it can't, you have to start over. You don't have a valid test, like an analytically valid test. So assuming it does, how do you know then that that particular CYP450 uh, um, genotype that you've measured is actually associated with the phenotype you think it is. And that could be more molecular type phenotypes, like the metabolizer status of, of, of a certain medication, or the kind of more downstream phenotypes, such as whether a drug has efficacy or safety for the individual. And then once you've determined the clinical validity, then clinical utility is, all right, using that information in patient care, does it actually improve outcomes? Can it change treatment decisions? And does the changing of that treatment decisions improve rates of remission of depression, improve safety profile of the medications? So when I think about that framework and applying it to PRS, I still think it's very helpful, although there's some unique things about PRS that maybe don't exactly fit to, to the EGAP model. So the idea of analytic validity um, is a little unique. You're not looking for just an A or just a T at a certain location. PRS is a kind of is a different construct in, in its measurement. So all, that has implications for what kind of impl imputation platform are you using? Um, what, what is the call rate of the assay um, that, that is not necessarily there for, for other you know, single SNP uh, tests you might perform or other, other tests in laboratory medicine? And then I won't have time to do this topic justice, but the clinical validity of PRS, that, does, that association between the score and the disease or the trait of interest um, really does vary between populations. And that's kind of a critical area of, of health equity concern for the clinical application of PRS. Although I am, I am heartened to see that there's, there's a lot of improvement in this area as more diverse cohorts and methods are being recruited. So here, and you know, on the subject of, of different populations, here's an example of how, say, a polygenic risk score is associated with, in this case, again, coronary artery disease in three different groups that were identified by racial and ethnic, ethnic status. So European Americans, African Americans, and Hispanic Americans in this example. Um, so you can see that the absolute risk associated with a given quantile of polygenic risk score is slightly different between these populations, 
although overall the pattern holds. So being in the lowest tertile is associated with lower absolute risk of coronary disease compared with the top tertile in these three different populations. So an example of the clinical validity, these associations are real. Um, there, is, there is some lower accuracy in different populations, but these patterns that we see, the association between PRS and the risk of a disease seem to be pretty robust and seem to hold up across populations. So then we're left with, all right, well, is this going to make any difference in the way we take care of patients? Great. The, the associations are real, but can we demonstrate that using these tests can change patient management and improve outcomes? So when maybe when you were thinking about how you would answer that question, a uh, PRS is clinically useful when maybe you thought about, well, it can tell who's low risk and high risk, right? But then so what? So we can, in clinical practice, I might be able to identify some of my patients that I think are at low risk or high risk for a certain disease, but what am I going to do with that information? The, the clinical management does not stop there. Can you do something different about that risk? So potentially things that have been hypothesized or that... For those at high risk, you could implement more aggressive disease screening um, earlier, a different modality that's more intensive, maybe more frequently, um, earlier, more aggressive prevention, either through preventive medications or through more aggressive lifestyle modification, motivate patient behavior change. We know that's hard, um, but that's often proposed as a hypothesis for how PRS might be used. We, we don't talk a lot about how being at low risk might help de-implement potentially unnecessary uh, preventive preventive medicine strategies, such as less aggressive screening for low risk individuals, or less aggressive uh, disease uh, other preventive measures. Um, but that has also been proposed as as one potential element of clinical utility. Actually, de-implementing unnecessary uh, interventions for which the benefits don't clearly outweigh the risks. So when I'm thinking, when I think about actionability, you know, a polygenic risk score is a continuum. I showed you that bell curve, but in, in a simplified way of thinking about it, ultimately you have to, you, the clinician or you, the clinician and the patient together have to make a decision. Are we doing something or not? Are we getting a colonoscopy? Yes or no. Are we starting a baby aspirin? Yes or no. Now, of course, medical care is not that kind of single moment point in time. It's, okay, am I getting a colonoscopy and am I getting it every five years or every 10 years? You know, like a lot of medical management is ongoing. Um, but I do think it's helpful when you think about the clinical utility is what would that action threshold be? Recognizing it might be different for different patients, certainly different for different diseases. But I, I think this, this rubric that colleagues and I wrote about a couple of years ago is a helpful way to think about how you take the continuous measure of a PRS to the somewhat dichotomous action that needs to result from it. Before I move on, I do want to circle back to that idea of de-implementing unnecessary tests. We, supported by this, this award, we actually did a national survey of primary care doctors um, in the, across the U.S. about polygenic risk scores and their perceived utility of it. And you can see for each of the possible uses of how they might use a polygenic risk score, preventive medications, screening, lifestyle modifications, you saw a bias towards doing more for high-risk individuals and not doing less for the low-risk individuals, kind of a commission bias of wanting to do more, but still not quite sure that they would want to use polygenic risk scores to stop screening individuals, um, which I think is not surprising. Um, we've talked a little bit about actionability. You know, that last part of the EGAP uh, definition of clinical utility was an ability of a test to improve health outcomes. So I often think about that as a scale, a trade-off of risks and benefits. So potential risks being using a polygenic risk score could lead to a cascade of harmful medical interventions that are unnecessary, that don't re result in that benefit. On the other hand, the benefit would be the earlier detection and prevention of disease. Let me, let me pivot now as I lead into the Genova study, which is the randomized trial we're doing now, is to say, all right, we've started to define a little bit about what clinical utility might mean. Do we need a randomized trial to, to demonstrate clinical utility? So this may be something that we discuss in the, in the Q&A afterwards, but you probably know that randomized trials are the gold standard for determining the effectiveness of interventions. And yet, most of what we do in clinical medicine is not based on RCT level evidence. Um, so I give the example of routine lab tests. We don't have RCTs that say we should periodically check a patient's kidney function or complete blood counts. 
So I, I've often thought it's helpful to say, well, are we, when we're talking about PRS, are we talking about it as a lab test by itself, or is it really a part of an intervention that might be used, in, a part of a preventive medicine intervention? And in the Genova study, we see it as the latter. So Genova is, stands for the Genomic Medicine at VA study. So that's where I practice uh, in, in the VA system. So we wanted to implement polygenic risk scores for six different diseases and put them into a primary care setting to see if we could improve patient outcomes by doing that. So the six diseases are those that are common in adult medicine and, and for which primary care doctors already have an approach to screening. So atrial fibrillation, coronary disease, type 2 diabetes, breast cancer for women, prostate cancer for men, or colorectal cancer. We are enrolling just over a thousand of these individuals. We did want to, even though we're using a, a SNP chip, we did want to identify any valid actionable monogenic variants on the chip and report those out to participants and then make sure those individuals get connected to care. But otherwise, for those individuals that do not have a, a monogenic finding, we generate polygenic risk scores for five diseases for each individual. And all of those patients that have at least one polygenic risk score consistent with a twofold increased risk of the disease, as, as in the published literature, we call the high risk group. And anyone, everyone else who does not have any high risk results is in, is in the, the not high risk group. And that's about one third, two thirds. And within those two strata, we randomize. So those individuals get their results either at baseline or they get it after two, the two year follow up period. And we follow all the individuals then for for the 24 months for new for new diagnoses of disease, change in management, and some other patient-centered outcomes that I'll show you on a subsequent slide. So we described uh, last year in Nature Medicine our approach to developing a clinical assay. So a lot has been written about what we call that phase one of PRS. So that's the first part. You know, a lot of the epidemiology, the statistical genetics, the innovation in, in methods. But the, 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 it doesn't end there, right? You need to still develop a lab test. So we, we've described how we came up with a clinically valid lab test and what we used to, to make sure that was a CLIA, you know, up to clinical standards to be used for clinical decision-making. We also have developed a report, I'll show you on another slide, that we think is very high level and yet transparent about the limitations of the results. Um, and then Number three is really what Genova is all about. What is this going to do in the patient care setting and what are patients and doctors gonna do with the information? So as I mentioned, we do see polygenic risk scores as a part of an intervention, not a standalone lab test that you would order. So in addition to the report, and I'm showing you here, this individual has a increased risk of prostate cancer and subsequent pages of the report to go, go more into that more. Um, but we also, the, the anyone with a high risk results uh, discusses those results with a physician or a genetic counselor. The polygenic the reports are sent to the primary care provider are put into the medical record. We have patient and PCP level information sheets with recommendations based on these results. So here's the our our patient result a patient supportive information for colorectal cancer on the left and for providers on the right. You know we 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 try to stay within within what we think the evidence. Uh, evidence suggests. We, we are forthcoming and say, you know, guidelines currently don't speak to what you should do differently, if anything, about an individual with a high PRS for colorectal cancer. But as a reminder, here are, here are what the current guidelines do say about an approach to, to colorectal cancer. And, and you might think about how to put that into your screening. Any of you, if you've practiced in the VA system, you'll recognize our EHR. So we do have these results uh, as, as structured data in the EHR in addition to the, the PDF results saved to. And this is our conceptual model that when we think about how to measure the outcomes of doing this. So our primary, our primary outcome is the time to diagnosis of new disease. So we actually think in this population, using PRS in the clinical setting will actually accelerate the time to new diagnosis among the high-risk individuals. So we do think that patients and providers will use this information, perhaps order appropriate diagnostic tests and, di and diagnose undiagnosed previously prevalent disease, such as a case of type 2 diabetes that, that had, not been, had never been checked and A1C had never been ordered. 
or newly incident cases of the disease in the two-year follow-up period. Um, we're also measuring process outcomes, such as the change in management, different tests and procedures the provider orders, um, patient-level outcomes, including activation, medication adherence, quality of life. And we're, we've, we're, we're checking in with PCPs on their perceived utility in addition to healthcare costs. Um, so with that, I want to just give you kind of a taste of where this line of research has gone or is going. So, you know, very much informed by the work that I did in Genova, I started to think about prostate cancer as being really an exemplar condition where we don't have great approaches to screening currently, where the polygenic risk scores are starting to be pretty advanced and can actually discriminate a significant amount of disease um, among individuals. And at least in the practice, in the population that I take care of, the veteran population is a huge, is a, is a, is a significant problem. Um, and so this, the PROGRESS study, the Prostate Cancer Genetic Risk and Equitable Screening Study, we hope to start enrolling next year, funded by a grant from the VA, which will enroll 5,000 men uh, nationally to a, to a randomized trial of precision screening for prostate cancer versus usual care. Um, and so uh, I look forward to sharing those, that, that experience over the next few years with you. Um, and it certainly has been an outgrowth of the work that was was supported by this, this innovator project. So with that, I want to thank the Genova team. Um, this really has been a team effort. Of course, the patients and participants of the Genova study and NHGRI for funding this work. And I'm looking forward to the conversation. Great. Thank you, Jason. So that was a really fantastic um, presentation and um, kind of description of what are polygenic risk scores and what does clinical utility mean? And um, my role here today is really to try to put this into a larger context. And um, I really appreciate the invitation from NHGRI to be here today and to um, present along with Jason and talk about some of the work that I've been doing over uh, several years now. And um, I really want to focus in on some of the thinking that we've been doing as part of the ClinGen program. And this is another program that is funded by NHGRI. Um, and we've really had the opportunity to think very carefully about actionability and what does that mean and how would we define it and assess it. Um, over the past uh, decade, we've really been thinking about this in the context of monogenic conditions. Um, and more recently, we've started thinking about what would this framework look like uh, in the context of polygenic risk scores. And as Jason already mentioned, we're really building upon work that was funded through the Centers for Disease Control, the ACE framework or ACCE framework, as well as um, the work that was done in the EGAP program to really think about carefully, how do we evaluate genomic applications? And so to just put this into a little bit broader context of uh, several of the different consortia that are funded by NHGRI, as uh, Jason mentioned, there are these different components, the statistical validity, or that's part of the analytical validity of the polygenic risk score, then the clinical validity is the polygenic risk score associated with the outcome that you're looking at. Um, the clinical utility piece that we really focus on um, in our actionability working group. And then I want to touch a little bit upon implementation, which Jason also already mentioned in some of the trials that they've been doing. I really want to make a distinction here between evidence generation and evidence curation. So evidence generation is really um, the individuals and the research teams that are conducting the research that are producing um, the primary evidence and publishing that in the literature um, and conducting those clinical trials or observational studies that we use to assess the evidence for each of these pieces. 
and a couple of the consortia funded by NHGRI that are involved in evidence generation include the Primed Consortium and the Emerge Consortium, in particular in the area of polygenic risk scores. And then the ClinGen Consortium is really focused on evidence curation or evidence synthesis. So taking the information that has been generated through other studies and synthesizing that, putting that information together into a picture that we can see across all the studies that have been done um, to look at both validity and actionability. So uh, in ClinGen, we have two different work groups that focus on these two different pieces because they are both, they are each uh, quite large uh, areas to focus on. And then I also want to mention the role of professional societies, which are critically important because not only do they conduct their own evidence synthesis activities, but they also um, make practice guidelines and recommendations based upon the evidence synthesis that has been conducted either uh, through their own efforts or through evidence synthesis that is done elsewhere. So um, those are really critical components of figuring out uh, how we use this information to care for patients. So the types of actions that we think about uh, in the context of monogenic conditions were really primarily focused on the individual person and things like whether a treatment would change, whether we might change a method of screening or surveillance, or maybe the screening interval um, might change. Circumstances to avoid might be something like um, avoiding certain dietary factors um, or other kinds of lifestyle factors um, that may put you at increased risk. Um, if you also have a genetic um, risk for that condition. And then referral to specialists would be where um, you see evidence that there is better health outcomes when patients with these conditions are actually treated within a specialist group that focuses on those conditions. However, in the context of polygenic risk scores, we not only focus on those kinds of actions that are oriented towards the person, but we also think about um, actions that are related at a societal or a systems level. And so this might be um, including things like how you manage the health of an entire population, as well as how you manage uh, healthcare costs. Um, and de-implementation might be an example um, that's related to healthcare costs. So these are some additional considerations um, that we think about with polygenic risk scores. Uh, there, are four, there are five domains that we really think about in the context of polygenic risk scores, and uh, these are adapted from the framework that we developed for monogenic conditions, but um, there are some nuances and differences. So the first area or domain is the severity of the outcome. Um, and this is really assessing things like the clinical features associated with the condition, the natural history, what is the typical age at onset, um, how quickly does the disease typically progress, things like that. But in the context of polygenic risk scores, we also think it's important to have that population and societal perspective and really thinking about what is the prevalence and the incidence of this condition. Um, in, in the whole population. In terms of the outcome likelihood, um, ideally we would have information on absolute risk. I'll show you in a moment that a lot of times we don't have that ideal information and um, then we need to rely upon measures of relative risk. Um, as Jason really illustrated in his slides, uh, identifying or defining thresholds for action to take a quantitative polygenic risk score um, and convert it into something where um, you would take the action among people who are above the threshold and 
not take action for those who are below the threshold. Um, or you could take the polygenic risk score as a uh, quantitative variable and think about the entire spectrum of risk. Um, and then we also really want to think about risk at both ends of the distribution. As Jason also mentioned, those who are at lower risk, you may be able to de-implement um, some um, healthcare and um, because those individuals are known to be at lower risk. The intervention effectiveness is really very similar, um, whether you're talking about a monogenic condition or a polygenic risk score. Um, and really we're looking at whether uh, there are professional societies or other groups who have recommended interventions based on evidence um, that they are effective actions to reduce morbidity and mortality. And uh, in our context, we are really focused on healthcare settings. Um, so this is not really including things like um, personal utility as part of this definition, but really focusing on interventions that would happen within a healthcare setting. The nature of intervention, um, is looking at what are the potential harms or side effects or complications that could happen um, from using the intervention. And colonoscopy is a good example where, um, you know, this is a really important screening tool that we have, but we do see somewhat lower adherence than we would like to see in the population in terms of acceptance of this um, procedure. Uh, that's one example. Um, and then level of evidence for polygenic risk scores where we are in the state of the science today is um, we really think that the level of evidence is likely to be fairly low um, given the emerging nature of polygenic risk scores and their use in clinical practice. However, we think defining a framework like this up front is really helpful in terms of helping people think through and plan the kinds of studies that we would like to see in order to develop the evidence base uh, to ultimately move this into clinical practice. As we were thinking through what are the domains that we really uh, want to care about, um, there were a few domains that we are interested in that we were concerned that we just wouldn't have sufficient data available to us to um, assess these domains. So we uh, include them in our framework, but um, not necessarily part of our assessment, but more to highlight the gaps and future needs um, for the research direction. So one is um, looking at the chance to escape clinical detection and um, whether knowing the information about the polygenic risk score is really going to um, impact the time to intervention and really um, be able to make a difference for those patients. Um, we also are very interested in evaluation of utility across ancestral populations. Right now, I'll show you in a moment that um, just our evidence base is not quite ready to um, do this evaluation across all ancestral populations, but this is somewhere we need to get to in the future. And so we want to capture this information in order to highlight the gaps that exist currently. And finally, looking at cost effectiveness of the intervention, um, we are concerned that the field is just not quite ready yet to uh, conduct these studies, but we do think it is an important aspect to consider. So our goal is to develop three different kinds of assessments. One is an actionability summary report, which is really a qualitative synthesis of the evidence and um, just lays out the information um, and makes that available to people. Um, then actionability scores are a semi-quantitative metric that will score each of those 
um, five domains that I mentioned previously. Um, and then the actionability assertions are based on those consensus scores using the semi-quantitative metric, um, but really using categories that are descriptive of definitive actionability, strong actionability, moderate actionability, and limited actionability uh, to kind of help with the clinical interpretation. So I wanna go through an example looking at breast cancer uh, in terms of where we are at with curating the evidence. This is currently a work in progress, so um, still more to be done, but I think this can really highlight some of the challenges with synthesizing um, this evidence. Um, and so this first slide is looking at what are, what do we mean by um, a polygenic risk score for breast cancer. And in fact, there are many different polygenic risk scores that have been published in the literature um, and that have been assessed in different studies and data sets. And overall, in our search, we found uh, 112 different polygenic risk scores that have undergone a total of 366 different performance assessments in different um, study data sets. So, um, that is a lot of variability um, and trying to narrow this down and uh, think about in what ways are these the same and in what ways are they different and how would we collapse the evidence across all of these different polygenic risk scores. So one of the things we did was um, to exclude some of the polygenic risk scores that are focused on um, very specific questions like um, whether uh, it's in males, for instance, or whether it's including only a particular subtype of breast cancer, like ER positive only, or whether you're predicting risk for metachronous breast cancer or contralateral breast cancer. So we excluded those, um, and that ended up with 95 polygenic risk scores with a total of 183 performance assessments. Um, and so we were still thinking about how do we sort through all of these. Um, and we decided initially that we would focus on those polygenic risk scores that exclusively used uh, genetic or genomic information um, and did not include other risk factors like age at menarche, family history, or BMI. Not to say that those other risk factors and risk models are not important. We absolutely think they are important, um, and we absolutely intend to go back and look at those, um, but we thought it would be an easier starting point to just focus on the ones that included the genomic information only. And so that left us with 91 polygenic risk scores, um, with 140 performance assessments. So that's still quite a lot of information. Um, and this is just looking at some of those uh, 140 risk assessments. And here you can see that um, most of the uh, assessments are using a relative risk as the measure um, of association versus an absolute risk measure. Um, and you can also see in the table on the right that um, we're looking at what population was the polygenic risk score developed in, what population was it validated in, and what population has it been evaluated in. Um, and you can see that there has been much more work that has been done in European populations than in um, populations that include other ancestry groups. Um, and then in terms of looking at the evidence or actions that could be taken, one of the primary ways that we do that is to look for practice guidelines. Um, and so first we wanted to see, are there any guidelines out there um, that are based on polygenic risk scores? And uh, the two guidelines that we found actually um, indicate that we're, we're not ready to make um, recommendations, practice guidelines um, for polygenic risk scores. So should not be used for clinical management at this time and use is recommended in the context of a clinical trial as an example. 
So the next thing we wanted to look at is whether there are any guidelines that are based on a threshold of risk. Because if your polygenic risk score um, can predict an absolute risk for an individual that exceeds a threshold, um, then these guidelines would apply to that polygenic risk score potentially. Um, and so here's where we um, are able to find some guidelines that have um, differences in how to manage the patients based on the absolute thresholds of risk for those patients. However, as I showed you in the slide earlier, um, a lot of our polygenic risk scores are showing us relative risks rather than absolute risks. And so this is still uh, a challenge for us to know whether the polygenic risk scores are actually exceeding these, thresh these thresholds. I wanna end with just a few additional implementation considerations um, that even once we have determined that it is analytically valid, it's clinically valid, and there is actionability, there are still some more challenges um, that we need to think about how to implement polygenic risk scores. And the first one is that, um, you know, the vast majority of our data that we have so far in order to develop these polygenic risk scores have been in individuals with European ancestry, which in the left-hand graph is represented by um, the area in the red color. And um, you can see in the right-hand graph that the prediction accuracy of the polygenic, uh, the PRS compared to a European population is actually um, lower for populations aside from the European population. to change this and give us more information um, on global populations. Um, as I mentioned before, we kind of left out many of the polygenic risk scores that include clinical information, but I think one of the main questions that people have is whether the genomic information or the polygenic risk score is adding to the risk that we can um, predict based on clinical features for those patients. Um, and this is just an example for breast cancer again. Um, and the kind of pinkish color bar is using the clinical features alone. Um, and then the blue color is the additional uh, improvement in risk prediction that you get um, by adding the polygenic risk score to the clinical information. And so um, 0.5 is like a flip of a coin, you're doing no better than that. And then 1.0 would mean you have perfect prediction. So you can see there is some improvement on that scale with adding the genomic information to the clinical information, but um, it's not a huge difference. Um, for the ones with the hash colored bars, those are predicting prognosis. Um, so once you've already been um, diagnosed with the condition, um, what is your chance of survival and your um, prognostic outcome look like? And so you can see that there's a little bit um, stronger difference between just the clinical characteristics and adding the genomic information for um, those scenarios. As Jason already mentioned, uh, de-implementation at lower risk is uh, really something that is we, we should be thinking about, but that there are a lot of concerns. And this is a, a framework that when Norton and colleagues developed um, about the de-implementation process, and this was a generic framework, not just specifically in the context of polygenic risk scores, but you can see that there are several different kinds of issues that need to be addressed. Um, including the magnitude of the problem, whether it's actually causing harm, um, is it 
um, reducing equity in the population in terms of the various different kinds of actions that could be taken in, in terms of de-implementation? Are you just reducing um, exposure to that intervention? So for instance, by expanding the screening interval, or are you replacing it? Use drug A instead of drug B, or are you completely removing or restricting um, that action for those who are at low risk? So they no longer need this screening at all, for instance. Um, there are a lot of barriers and facilitators at multiple levels from the patient perspective um, when we look at cancer screenings, for instance, where we've tried to increase the screening interval, one of the things that we see from the patient perspective is a, a concern about trust. Are they really, is it really safe for them? Um, they've been getting the screening on an annual basis for a long time. Is it really safe to make that interval longer? Um, from the provider perspective, they have concerns about legal risks, um, about communicating with the patients that it is safe um, and making that clear with patients. And they may even still be getting reimbursed whether they um, do the screening or the intervention on an annual basis at, or at a lower interval. Um, and so we need strategies at all of these levels to really address those, these barriers. And finally, we have a lot of workflow and delivery system integration issues that we will need to think about. Um, these are to some extent listed within the ACE framework um, and particularly within the context of clinical utility, but in the way that we've defined and thought about actionability, um, we really aren't thinking about the implementation pieces yet. And I think this is something that we will really need to pay attention to and address in terms of actually ensuring that these um, polygenic risk scores can be used in clinical practice. And it will include all of the people who are involved from the patient, the care team, to the regulator, all the processes, the tools that are needed to implement those interventions, as well as the information that's needed. So um, if we need to have some assessment um, cl of clinical features that goes along with the genomic information, how do we get that information? How is it transformed into an interpretable result? Jason showed you some nice reports that they've been working on um, what is the output and how do people make decisions based on that output? So I'd really like to thank the team that uh, has been thinking about this with me and all of these thoughts really reflect the thoughts of the whole group and I'll end there and hand things over to Rob, thanks. Great, thanks Katrina and thank you, Jason. Um, wonderful talks on a great topic. Um, so, you know, while we wait for some questions to come in, I, I have a few questions about polygenic risk, especially since I, we do think the biggest impact they're going to have is in primary care. So, Jason, uh, really appreciate the work you're doing there. Um, you know, looking at polygenic risk score, I mean, we've learned a lot from monogenic. And as you know, it's been slow to uptake monogenic testing, even in primary care settings. And as you look at polygenic risk score, I mean, it seems to me so almost exponentially more complicated and there's so many more variables. Um, what kind of, from our experience with monogenics, how, how do you think we should start thinking about rolling out polygenic risk scores into clinical practice? Yeah, I mean, you're right. The easier question is how are they different? <laughs> so it's the harder question about what can we learn from the monogenic uh, diseases. Yeah. I, I actually do think there's a pivotal moment in the field when we started to realize that PRS at the at a certain upper upper tail can actually start to approximate the kind of effect sizes we were seeing with monogenic disease. So the you know the the increased risk of coronary disease from familial hypercholesterolemia has a polygenic equivalent. And I think that was a helpful anchoring because if nothing else, you could actually identify that upper tail of people that almost had a monogenic like risk from their PRS. So mm -hmm. if, if in that sense, some of the learning from monogenics could apply, but as you suggested, like there's so many other differences. Um, 
maybe some other takeaways from the monogenic world are, you know, an understanding that there are not enough genetic professionals to go around, not for, so we already know that with monogenic disease. And now we're at a place where everybody could have a PRS result. It might be median, low or high, but everyone has a result. Everyone's somewhere on the bell curve. So I think we have to learn about how we have tried to mainstream some of the more common genomic medicine scenarios in the monogenic space and take some, some of that knowledge about what kind of implementation strategies work or do not work to help help mainstream and help kind of upskill the providers uh, to, to handle some of that information. And there's that's a whole topic of itself, some of those strategies, but um, yeah. it's a challenge. It's a challenge. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And then Katrina, kind of looking at some of the stuff, I mean, you, you talk about the curation of monogenics and just thinking, I mean, people from all over the world, you know, are contributing to that, you know, given the same complexity of polygenic risk score from a kind of a curation standpoint, I mean, where do we get the time and resources to think about doing some of these curation for these more complicated things, thinking that you have 99 different tests versus just this one? Yeah, that's a, thing, a great question, Rob. And I think that we have an opportunity here um, that we maybe didn't have with monogenic conditions because this is relatively new and we're it's still emerging. And that we are trying to think about um, reporting standards and um, databases where people can contribute information um, that I think will make it a little bit easier for us to find the information that we need um, if we are able to work together as a research community um, to ensure that our publications include those reporting standards and that our data makes it into um, the, the common databases so that we can find the information a little bit easier. A lot of what is happening in the um, monogenic um, area is really needing to do a lot of literature search um, that is very manual and time consuming because we didn't have these standards in place up front. Yeah, great point. Glad that you're doing that work <laughs> <laughs> involved with that. You know, uh, as we all know in clinical practice that, you know, um, things make it to the clinic before the evidence is necessarily there. And so patients showing up with polygenic risk for, I, I guess if there's, you know, clinicians on the call, I mean, where would they start to lean to kind of know what to do with that when a patient does bring these results to them? Um, is there resources out there that they can lean on or individuals that you'd recommend? So I, I can go, I mean, some of it really is, could be the wild west. So it's, it's hard to give a, a single answer. The first, the first step I would recommend is start with the test report itself. So what is this lab? Who are they? Where did this come from? Um, is it a clinical lab? Um, is it that the, is it that the patient access some, they had their maybe direct to consumer SNP chip data and upload it to a third party to generate these PRS. You really have to look at that document to know where to start. Um, otherwise, there are some good publicly available resources. You know, the CDC uh, has some good information about genomics in general and polygenic risk scores specifically. NHGRI does too. Um, but, you know, like with many other things that say the PCP encounters, they they start to develop kind of this trusted network of other colleagues they can curbside. I'm happy to be that for any of you on the call or on the meeting. Um, but I would really start with the test report itself. And ideally, if it's a reputable lab, they the 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 lab itself would have a 1-800 number or an email address for more information for that specific test. And I'll just add to that um, to consider the pro professional societies in terms of what the practice guidelines are um, and have that as a resource. And uh, I really think what Jason pointed to in terms of thinking of a systems level solution rather than individual providers needing to each solve this on their own. So hopefully within the healthcare system that providers are working, there would be 
um, somewhere to go to get those questions answered. Yeah, definitely more resources there. Um, we had one of the uh, question come in asking about uh, especially increasing diversity within the PRS. And the question is, you know, is there any ongoing work to take into account non-European groups in order to make PRS more applicable, applicable to the whole population? Yeah, so um, the primed consortium that NHGRI has funded, um, I think is really focused on that work as well as the eMERGE consortium. Um, these are two large consortia which are not only including more diverse populations as part of the study populations that they're looking at, but they're also really focused on the methods. Um, so how are we going to develop polygenic risk scores in a way that is applicable um, across all the different ancestral groups? So I think those are two very different but important questions, not only having the study populations in place, but also having the methods. Methods, yeah. Yeah, great questions and answers. Thanks. I mean, one of the other thing that comes to mind, I mean, I mean, as you think through, and this is more kind of a research question, there's always that difficulty in terms of knowing when to intervene and how to intervene. As we kind of think forward with randomized clinical trials, how should we go about getting that evidence base, not necessarily to prove the utility, but just to understand, you know, do we implement these in children? Do we start at, at 20 years old? Uh, where do you see us getting that type of information to drive those clinical trials? I, I can start, and I'm interested in what Katrina says. Um, it really <laughs> depends on the it really depends on the disease um, for a lot of these conditions. You know, you uh, you know if it is if it is a if it's a dementia, um, powering a trial that starts in children is going to be a big ask for a sponsor. <laughs> um, <laughs> right. So it really it really you know so so the typical considerations of a clinical trial effect size that you'd expect, what kind of observation period you need would come into play when talking about a trial. Um, you know, already the WISDOM trial uh, is looking at this question in breast cancer, a more precision approach, and includes a polygenic risk score and other factors mm -hmm. to breast cancer screening. Um, and then, as I mentioned, our prostate cancer uh, trial that we're launching uh, next year also has, has looked at, we, you know, doing it at the right age range that seems to be the clinically applicable use. Um, the earlier in the life course questions are really important and, and a lot, I think a lot more difficult to answer with a trial. Yeah. Right. And um, can I add to that, Rob? I'll just oh, definitely. say um, not to make things more complicated, but um, I think I would also recommend to really think about the implementation questions early on um, and to think about designing hybrid uh, studies that look at both effectiveness and implementation um, as a way to um, try to accelerate um, that research agenda and ensure that the work that we're doing um, can actually be disseminated and used in um, typical clinical practices outside of a um, clinical trial. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Yeah. Um, kind of going on to, we've, we talked a lot about the science and just wondering, I mean, what kind of ethical, legal, social type issues should we be thinking about or are unique to PRS that we really haven't faced before in clinical practice? Are there any? That's a, that's a bold statement to say what's unique. Yeah. I mean, there, so Katrina has already mentioned about the, the reduced accuracy in un, traditionally underrepresented populations. So I think, I think that probably is the most pressing ethical, ethical concern. Um, mm -hmm. There are parts of biomedicine, you know, huge parts of biomedicine that are based on unrepresentative data. So in that sense, PRS are not unique, but there, there are really some, some unique statistical genetics considerations uh, when it comes to, to PRS that fortunately groups like the Prime Consortium are working on. Mm -hmm. um, 
So I really think when it comes to kind of the ethical issues, that really is top of mind. Maybe a second one is, uh, and I'm going to propose it and then say maybe it's overstated, this idea that the use of polygenic risk scores will detract from other environmental, lifestyle, social determinants of health that we know are probably more important for many of the diseases we take care of. Um, so that is a concern. I take it back, though, because at the end of the day, I actually think patients and primary care providers have more common sense, I think, than to place all their eggs in the PRS or genetic basket. They're very aware of those other risk factors. So, But I think it is worth at least naming as a potential concern and over-reliance on genetics. It, it all talks about contextualizing these. I mean, your, your first slide that you show, I mean, in 12 minutes, you're supposed to go through all those and understand them and put them into context, which creates a challenge. It's, it's, it's definitely there. Um, just for both of you, I mean, as if there's like primary care physicians listening in, what would you like them to take away from this talk? There's one thing. Um, I would I would like them to take away from this talk that polygenic risk scores are probably coming their way and um, to get ready, but also that they are not alone in this and um, that I think we can absolutely develop systems for delivering polygenic risk scores as part of clinical care that supports primary care clinicians. And we really need PCPs to be part of the study teams um, so that we can design these in a way that will work for them. Yeah, and I'll, I'll echo that. I, I would tell the PCP, these associations are real. PRS are a real thing. Uh, the associations are the magnitude of how much it'll impact your patient's care and outcomes, I think remains to be seen. And that's an active area of research. And absolutely, like Katrina said, your your healthcare system is doing you a disservice if it has its, uh, if you know, by the time PRS emerge and become more prevalent, if systems aren't being put in place to support your use of that, because it's not, you you couldn't be expected to go it alone on, yeah. on implementing that technology. Yeah, really does create a, a significant challenge for primary care with a significant part of people not in a health system and where they get those resources. So those are some great points. Uh, we did have another question that came in. I think I think it's going to this one. One of the things is, as you know, is we develop stuff in research and that translation into clinical practice. And this one kind of is in the lines with that. Is uh, Do you envision ongoing evaluation of polygenic risk scores as they are reported? And so the example would be, would it, will it be possible to evaluate new PRS in the existing Genova study? And I, I guess that's a, a common question that we hear too is, as we improve these scores, at what time do you make a decision to exchange or add in addition to that study? Yeah, so maybe maybe there's a couple questions there. One, do yep. we how often do we update our pipeline for new, you know, new prospectively uh, tested patients? And I think maybe that's the question, and not do we go back and reinterpret and 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 recontact the patients and tell them they have an update report? That that has a lot of implementation challenges, as we even already know, kind of from the monogenic space. Um, we do we do in terms of kind of prospectively our pipeline. We do um, we are certainly aware of new GWAS and new PRS methods that are coming out near nearly constantly. Um, so it's a little bit of a, uh, if it's, a, it's a little bit of a resource uh, utilization to benefit ratio. Uh, so we have updated our materials. We've updated our pipeline as it has gone. Um, as you could imagine with a clinical test, that's, that can't be as reactive to every single publication that comes out. You know, we can't change it that quickly, um, but it is certainly, Certainly clinical labs, as they start to develop these assays and reports, will need to have that kind of plan in place. What will be their plan, their policy for how often they'll update those? And I'll just add that this is not a unique problem to genomic medicine, that <laughs> right. um, digital health, for instance, is another area where we see the technology evolving more quickly than we can conduct the research. And so by the time your research study is over, the technology has already advanced to a next generation. And so I think we need to um, 
really think about how to design our research studies to be nimble to allow for this um, change over time that is happening. Definitely. Definitely a challenge, especially with the pace of all these changes that happen so quick. It, you know, it also also makes you wonder in terms of hospital systems, are there going to be someday people just sit watching these different, you know, version control for no better term, making sure that the latest version is, is part of that health system and accurate. Um, I don't have any other questions, but I would like to just take this moment to thank both of you for um, taking the time out of your busy schedules to talk. I know it was, I definitely enjoyed it. And uh, we hope to see you in the future and we hope to, that you continue your work in polygenic risk score. Well, thank you. This, thank you for the invitation. It was a pleasure to be able to talk about this. Um, Katrina, thank you for the conversation. Yeah. And, to, and thanks to NHGRI for putting this on. And thanks to all everyone kinds of for being here and, um, and adding your questions and being part of the conversation. Thank you. Thank you both.